For thousands of years, uh, philosophers have told us that if we are to live our lives at their best, we should seek truth, beauty, and goodness. Of course, each of these qualities has raised thorny issues and has provoked ongoing arguments. That people have carried on such arguments rather than surrendering themselves to their raw appetites and animal instincts may be counted a valuable thing in itself. A final resolution of such deep questions may lie beyond human capacities. In regard to goodness and beauty, uh, I have nothing worthwhile to add to the discussion. For guidance in seeking goodness, we may look to saints, theologians, moral philosophers, and moral exemplars of our own acquaintance. For demonstrations of beauty, we may turn to nature and to artists, great and small, who have adorned our lives with the grace of music, poetry, and the visual arts. My own professional qualifications as an economist and an economic historian do not equip me to contribute anything of value in these areas. I do feel qualified, however, to speak with regard to truth because the search for truth has always served as the foundation of my intellectual endeavors. Moreover, my study, research, and reflection within my own professional domains have brought home to me a relationship that others might do well to ponder and respect. A relationship, indeed an array of relationships between truth and freedom such that anyone who seeks the triumph of truth must also seek to establish freedom in human affairs. In my career in academia, I discovered to my dismay that many of my colleagues had little interest in the search for truth, however one might understand or pursue it. To them, their research and publication amounted to a game in which the winning players receive the greatest rewards in salary, research funding, and professional acclaim. They understood that because of cloistered academic inbreeding, economists at the most prestigious universities consider the smartest guys to be those who employ the most advanced, complex, and incomprehensible mathematics in their modeling and empirical testing. I observed colleagues who became excited by their discovery of a mathematical theorem that had never been applied in economic research. These economists would look around for a plausible way to use the newly discovered mathematical theorem and to give it the appearance of economic relevance. In this way, mere technique drove research and publication. These economists did not consider or care uh, about whether the theorem would assist them in the discovery of economic truth. They cared only about showing off their analytical powers to impress their technically less advanced colleagues and journal editors. Unfortunately, these colleagues uh, often did feel intimidated by the authors of articles they could not understand because they did not know the mathematical techniques employed in the exposition. This entire enterprise, which continues even now, consumes valuable time and brain power in a misguided carnival of intellectually irrelevant one-upmanship. When we move from the realm of economic research to the realm of economic policy making, we encounter even more destructive falsehoods. Much modern economic theory, for example, has been used to justify government intervention in the free market process. We might pause to reflect that this process, which operates as a price system or seen from another angle, uh, as a profit and loss system is simultaneously a way of revealing the truth. 
Thus, for example, a price established on the free market communicates true information to all potential market participants about the exchange value of a good or service relative to other goods and services. If the government places an excise tax on the good, thereby diminishing the quantity demanded and raising the market price, potential buyers now react to a false signal of the good's true exchange value. If the government pays a subsidy to a goods producers, thereby increasing the quantity supplied and lowering the market price, potential suppliers now react to a false signal of the goods true exchange value. In both cases, changes in the amounts produced give rise to corresponding changes in the amounts of inputs demanded and those changes give rise to other market changes and so on. As the effects of a single government intervention in the market price system ripple outward from their source. Now those who have studied a little economics in a university may object that according to the theory of market failure, various deviations from hypothetical perfectly competitive conditions uh, may cause market determined prices to be distorted and outputs to be inefficient. And in this event, the government can intervene with taxes, subsidies, and regulations to bring the market into an efficient configuration. What these students probably were not taught, especially if they were not students at Francisco Marroquin, uh, they were probably not taught that this theory of market failure assumes a great deal that cannot be known to anyone except as it is determined in actual markets. Further, because the actual parameters of demand, cost, and supply functions are unknown and constantly changing in the real world, the government does not, indeed, cannot know how much to intervene what amount of tax to set, or how much to pay as a subsidy, for example. Further still, this theory implicitly assumes that the interventionist actions the governments take are themselves without cost. And one wonders how are the tax and subsidy agencies and the regulatory bureaucracies supported. Even further still, because in reality such interventions are the creations not of genuine economic experts who are themselves helpless enough, but of politicians, the interventions are intended to and do serve not the purpose of establishing an efficient allocation of resources, but the purpose of promoting the politicians' personal ideological and political ends. The entire apparatus of the theory of market failure, which is taught at almost every university in North America and Europe, uh, the entire apparatus is a sheer blackboard fantasy, an economic theorist plaything that has been accepted far too often as a helpful guide to or justification of government intervention in the market economy by putatively public-spirited legislators and regulators. In reality, the market system does foster an efficient allocation of resources. It constantly creates incentives for resource owners to direct their resources away from areas in which those resources have lesser value and toward areas in which they have greater value. Taxes, subsidies, and other government intrusions in the market process, in effect, falsify the price signals that guide market participants in their decisions about how much to buy, how much to sell, how to produce, where to produce, and exactly when to take various actions. If false prices should become established in a market system, if, if, for example, the price of gasoline in one town became greater than the price in a neighboring town by an amount 
greater than the cost of transporting a gallon of gasoline from one town to the other, entrepreneurs would have an incentive to move the product to the place at which it has greater value. In doing so, they would cause the lower price to become higher and the higher price to become lower and they would move the market toward a genuinely efficient allocation of resources. Government's interference in the price system blunts or destroys the incentives that otherwise lead entrepreneurs to reallocate resources efficiently. Taxes destroy the incentive to produce more of certain goods that, without the tax, would be profitable to produce. Subsidies create incentives to produce more of certain goods that, without the subsidy, would be unprofitable to produce. Taxes and subsidies, and likewise regulations in various more complex ways, distort the true information inherent in the free market's pricing process. By responding to the falsified prices of a government-distorted market system, entrepreneurs may enrich themselves, but only at the greater expense of the economy as a whole not to mention the sacrifice of economic freedom inherent in the government's coercive tax and subsidy system. In both the realm of economic research and the realm of economic policy, freedom is an essential condition for the generation of truth, and thus for the enhanced enjoyment of social life that depends on making use of true rather than false information. The academic world of the show-off, pyrotechnic economists who dominate today's mainstream profession would be impossible without the vast government subsidies that support these economists and the institutions in which they work. Given a choice, consumers would not buy their worthless products. The funds that support this superficially impressive intellectual showmanship must be extorted from taxpayers threatened with fines and imprisonment. In similar fashion, the grossly distorted economy in which, uh, to take but one example among thousands, ethanol producers and corn farmers are enriched at the expense of the direct and indirect consumers of corn throughout the world would be impossible without the huge subsidies and government mandates that have brought the biofuel industry to its present size and configuration. Without the various forms of taxes borne by producers today, many valuable goods and services would be supplied in enormously greater quantities. Work saving, investment, and technological progress would be much greater and economic growth much faster in a world that relied on true information about relative exchange values rather than on the false signals being brought into being by the government's coercive, politically inspired intrusions. In economics, as in other areas of life, the pursuit and exploitation of truth depend on freedom. Everyone knows that politicians are generally liars. Too few of us understand, however, that the free market itself is a grand generator of truth. And in general, government intrusion of any kind operates to substitute falsehood for this truth with devastating consequences for the genuine flourishing of social and economic life. Graduates, I congratulate you for your accomplishments and I urge you to remember that freedom and truth go hand in hand. Thank you very much.